Hi, and welcome to this first episode of the Research Liaison Team Open Knowledge Podcast. My name is Holly Limbert, and I'm the Repository and Open Access Librarian at the University of Derby. I'm based in the library, and I manage the university's research repository, Eudora. I also provide advice and guidance on the open research landscape, with a particular focus on open access. The release of this podcast is in celebration of Open Access Week, and I will be joined by some expert guest speakers to discuss their roles and passions, equity and open knowledge, and the future of scholarly communications. This episode will focus on the eBooks SOS campaign and open access books. I'm pleased to welcome Caroline Ball, who is the academic librarian supporting business law and social sciences at the university. Welcome, Caroline, and thank you for joining me today. To begin, could you please tell us a little about yourself, your background and professional interests? Um, yeah, so obviously my name is Caroline Ball. I am an academic librarian at the University of Derby, um, and my main role is supporting the College of Business Law and Social Sciences. So that basically means I'm a kind of main contact in the library for all the staff and all the students um, teaching and studying on those programmes. Um, I, in a previous life, um, I was also the university's copyright and licensing advisor. Um, so I'm one of those really boring people who can talk your ear off about copyright, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Um, and I've got a variety of, of sort of professional and personal interests that kind of overlap. Um, I'm very keen on um, Wikipedia um, as a teaching and learning tool in higher education. Um, and I'm a, a, I was Wikipedian of the year in 2020. Um, and I'm also on the board of trustees for Wikimedia UK. So that's a sort of a personal interest that, that's kind of come into um, my professional sphere because it's something that I'm really big on sort of promoting within higher education. Um, I'm also one of the organisers um, of the ebook SOS campaign, um, which is a campaign that over the last year or two has, has kind of been pushing back basically against things like publisher pricing practice, against um, restricted licences, um, against the kind of bundling practice, um, mainly really just sort of trying to push back against what, what we see as quite unethical practice um, from academic publishers in kind of exploiting the, the market um, that they sell to. So there's kind of a variety of things going on there and they all kind of merge at various points um, in my working life. That's fantastic. We all know you're an overachiever, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. I, I like to think it's just <laughs> um, I mean, we've kind of already just covered this a bit, but you've obviously been instrumental in getting the great ebooks SOS campaign off the ground. You've kind of gone into it a little bit, but could you talk a bit more about its importance uh, of the project and a bit more about perhaps future direction? Yeah, um, so the, the campaign was really kickstarted by um, Johanna Anderson from um, Gloucester University. Um, and uh, you know, it originally took the form basically of an open letter. Um, sort of originally, the idea was that uh, we would want to try and get the Education Select Committee involved in perhaps launching an investigation into the, the academic kind of publishing industry. Um, and it was something that really kind of came about largely because of the pandemic um, and the lockdowns of last year. Um, academic librarians, I think, have always struggled with ebooks. Um, you know, unlike sort of print books, they aren't immediately always available. Some publishers just won't sell to libraries. Um, they're often far, far, far more expensive um, than print books. They often have quite restricted licenses on them that mean that, you know, sometimes only one person or two or three people at a time can access them. Um, and sometimes they're only available in kind of um, bundles or packages. Um, you know, Johanna likes to sort of describe it as, as having to buy the entire of Waterstones just because you want one book. Um, and I think when the, the lockdowns of last year happened, I think it really brought the issue to a head because suddenly libraries were almost 100% reliant on those ebooks. Um, you know, we couldn't fall back on the position of, oh, well, we can't get this as an ebook or it's too expensive. We'll just buy more print copies. Um, and when we were in lockdown and university campuses were closed, we, we couldn't. We couldn't use print books anymore. You know, the libraries were closed. Students couldn't access them. So we were really 100% reliant on e-books. And that really highlighted um, just how kind of dysfunctional the market is, really, in, in the sense that there are books that libraries just cannot buy. You know, the, the publishers have decided not to make them available to libraries. Um, or there are e-books that, um, you know, we need to give access to 200, 300 students and the only licenses are the single user use. So 
I think a lot of these issues really kind of came to a head um, last year during the pandemic. And that's when we we kind of kickstarted this campaign and really tried to, A, I think, get awareness out there about these issues, because um, I think librarians are very good at hiding our labor. We are very good at making things look easy and, and hiding a lot of the kind of dysfunctionality that goes on behind the scenes. So I think a lot of staff and students really didn't know about these issues. So part of the reason for the campaign was about trying to get awareness and trying to, to you know, make staff and students realize that, you know, we are being awkward when we say we can't get this book. It, it, it is, we literally cannot get it, even if we wanted to buy it. Um, but I think it was also about getting kind of more public awareness, um, trying to get, you know, our institutions um, and our various sector bodies involved to, to try and kind of push back against publishers. Um, and I think we've been to a certain extent successful in that. Um, you know, the issue has really got quite a lot of attention. Um, it's been featured in the BBC, in The Guardian. Um, you know, it's been mirrored by um, kind of events um, in America over, overseas, um, you know, because this is not just a UK issue, this is a global issue, really. Um, and one of the things that we're doing at the moment is um, we put in a formal complaint to the UK Competition and Markets Authority, um, basically about this, this dysfunctional market. Um, and how we feel that it, it's harming kind of consumers um, like staff and students trying to study when, when libraries just can't make this kind of material available. Um, so currently the CMA is uh, investigating internally as to whether or not they're going to, to launch an investigation. They seem quite interested. They've been making encouraging noises. Um, and I definitely think publishers are getting a little rattled. Um, but I think also the big, you know, one of the biggest things about this whole kind of campaign really is that it's been getting libraries and institutions talking about this issue, um, you know, talking amongst themselves, making students and staff aware of these issues, you know, making university execs aware of these issues, which I think were really kind of going on sub rosa before. I think it was something that all librarians would, would know about, but really wasn't an issue outside of the library. So I think that has been a real achievement in, in kind of spreading that wider awareness um, and making people realize that, that, you know, it's a big issue and it really impacts on libraries' ability to, to make educational material available to our customers, you know, to the staff and the students studying and doing research. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of quietly optimistic at the moment that, that things are moving in a positive direction. And, and at the very least, I think we're, we're starting to push back against this kind of exploitative practice. Do you see access to e-books um, as a diversity and equity issue? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, 100 percent. I mean, you know, one of the biggest issues with the e-books that we can buy is that they're absolutely riddled with DRM, um, digital rights management, which really impacts on what students can do with, with those e-books. Um, you know, and I think that's absolutely a, a, a diversity, equality issue. You know, if you think about students with disabilities, for example, um, you know, students who might need to use, um, you know, audio tools or, or, you know, sort of book reading software or things, you know, a, a lot of these e-books will block that kind of um, accessibility tool. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that publishers say about why they charge so much for some of these e-books is, is that it's about all that kind of added value that they provide. You know, the platforms that the e-books are available on often have a lot of accessibility tools built in, which, which is true. You know, they do have options to, to change fonts, to change colors and sizes, to read aloud. Um, but often those options are inferior to the kind of software that some of our students will be using for themselves. And, and they can't then use that software with these books because they have so much digital rights management embedded in them. You know, students are restricted in how much they can download. They're restricted in how much they can print. Um, and I think that's a huge accessibility issue. Um, when you think about the fact that a book, a print book, you know, a student can use it with their read aloud software. They can use it with their accessibility software. There's no restrictions on on how long they can be using it for or, or how much of it they can copy if they need to for, for accessibility purposes. But ebooks are, are really a barrier in this sense um, because of the kind of digital rights management tools that are embedded within them. It really blocks um, a lot of students from, from getting what they need out of that book. Um, and I think that makes it a kind of huge equity issue. Um, I think, you know, there's also the issue that, you know, some students 
um, can afford to buy print books. You know, some students can can afford to go and buy a textbook if they find that the, the library doesn't have it in stock or, you know, the library has it as an ebook, but the, the licenses are really restrictive and only one or two people can access it at a time. You know, some students faced with that will, will get fed up and go, oh, well, I really need this book, so I'll go and buy it. But some students can't afford that. Um, you know, some students who, you know, perhaps are living in halls can very easily get to the library and just use the print book instead. But some students, you know, if they've got responsibilities, you know, if they've got children, if they're carers, if they've got jobs, you know, don't find it as easy to get to the library. And so they're more reliant on, on the e-books. Um, and so I think it really is an equity issue in terms of, you know, students who, who are almost 100% reliant on that digital content definitely lose out in comparison to students that have the kind of flexibility of choice between the print books and the e-books. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we would have a, a digital copy of every book we had in the library, um, you know, and it didn't have DRM and we could we could make it available as easily as we can the print books. But, you know, that that's an ideal world and it's not the one we're living in right now, unfortunately. So I, I think it does have a big impact on our students. It does have a big impact on their learning because it is a barrier to accessing information. You're absolutely right there. Um, and I think, I suppose, one of the things that could kind of address this issue that we've got with access to ebooks and, you know, scholarly literature in the more broader sense is to um, think more about embracing open access. And that kind of moves Definitely. on to yeah, and that that really moves on to the kind of the next um, part of the podcast where I just wanted to talk to you about um, your thoughts on um, you know open monographs and the scholarly monograph or the academic book kind of moving into the open space. And what we're seeing now is a kind of a transition for scholarly comms, um, and we're moving more towards that you know open sphere. And a lot of this has been driven forward by some of the big external funding mandates for open access, such as um, the recent release of UK Research and Innovations revised open access policy, which actually sees a mandate for um, the scholarly monograph to be open access from 2024, which is obviously an incredible um, change um, and something that's going to be quite, um, I would think, daunting for a lot of researchers, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. Do you think this is a realistic and achievable goal? What are your thoughts on that? 2024, you know, if you think about it, you know, we're at the tail end of 2021 now, so you're talking less than three years away. Um, change happens slowly <laughs> in higher education yeah. um, and academia and research, and, and I think that might be a bit of an ambitious goal. Um, I think, I think book chapters is probably more achievable. Um, I think, you know, I, I, and I honestly think one of the stumbling points with, with a lot of academics and a lot of researchers is possibly going to be the issue of royalties. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, all academics, all researchers are quite accustomed to the idea that you, you don't get paid for writing journal articles. You, no. don't get, you know, you don't get any money for that. It's part of the academic kind of cycle. This is the way it works. This is how your research gets out there. So I think having an open access mandate for things like um, journal articles is is not so much of an issue because I don't think academics feel like it's going to hit them personally. Um, I think with things like book chapters, I think it's probably going to be easier because, again, I think academics are very accustomed to the idea that you, you don't you don't get money for book chapters either, by and large. Um, you know, I myself have published a couple of book chapters and, you, you know, you, you don't get paid for that. Um, I think books themselves, you know, books monographs I think it's a bit more of a fuzzy area because that is an, an area where potentially you know the the author might get some kind of financial remuneration from that you know we're not talking millions we're not talking anyone becoming the next JK Rowling but <laughs> I think you know that there, there is an expectation that you know your book sells you're going to get a bit of money for that and so I think with things like academic books and monographs, I think there might be a bit more pushback on that because obviously open access would would be seen as potentially impacting on on sales. Um, now, obviously, you know when we talk about open access, you know it isn't you can walk up to a shop and get a copy of the book for free. If you want a physical copy of that that monograph or that book, you still have to you still have to pay for it, and so there's still going to be potential royalties. But 
you know, we are talking about digital versions being openly available online. And I think there will be some reluctance from academics um, and authors in, in that regard, um, in terms of the, the book or the monograph. Not so much with book chapters and edited collections, because as I said, you don't really expect to get any any kind of remuneration there. But I, I think there might be a bit of a pushback when it comes to actual books. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, like I said, but but you know, knowing the academics that I've spoken to, you know, and the concerns that they have when you do talk about open access, you know, this is something that that they think about. This is something that they they ask questions about. Um, you know, and and you know, in the past, by and large, you know, books haven't been covered by REF. Um, so they, they have been something that academics have very much done, not because of that kind of research expectation that comes with the job, but almost as a sideline, you know, because they want to produce texts for their students or they, they want to turn a PhD into a book. Um, so it's been more of a personal thing, I think, in some respects than a professional thing. And I think that's, that's where the challenge will lie. Um, so I, I'm not saying it's insurmountable and I'm, I'm definitely not saying it's impossible, but I do think maybe from 2024 might be a little bit ambitious. One thing that is also quite interesting or will be quite interesting will be kind of the, the next research excellence framework policy and what their, you know, their policy will say relating to um, books, whether there'll be a mandate mm. from open access for REF, because I think that obviously will have... With with things like with with um, organisations like UKRI and Wellcome Trust etc, um, I think because they're the big funders that are kind of predominantly funding research from kind of research intensive institutions, um, I think it will be REF that kind of drives forward maybe the open monograph agenda. Because, I think definitely. You know, I think you know. I think that. that the, the complicating factor is is that we're kind of talking almost in some ways about kind of two different things really because there's monographs which yeah. you know generally tend to to not be as long as a book generally right. tend to be still quite a focused piece of research um, but then you do have the other kind of books that our academics produce um, and and quite often those aren't necessarily research with a kind of capital R if you know what I mean yeah um, so those are the kind of things that I can't see coming under. The, the ref because it isn't research it isn't necessarily original research you know if an yeah. academic produces a textbook um that that isn't an original piece of research it's a, it's a hell of a lot of work but it's not you know based around a, a core kind of piece of research so yeah. that that's the kind of thing that isn't going to be covered by the ref and I, I would imagine it isn't going to be covered by these kind of funder mandates and I, I think you know when academics get a bit squirrely about you know open access and, and royalties and, and money you know, we're not talking about those kind of books. Um, and those are the kind of books quite often where, where, you know, academics will get some royalties, they will get some sales, you know, if they're producing a textbook for students, or, you know, they're producing a general introduction to a subject. Um, you know, those are the kind of, of you know, outputs that I, I don't see ever being covered by a ref, because they aren't really research in that sense. And I don't ever see being covered by funder mandates. So I think it is important to kind of distinguish between the two. Um, you yeah, know, the, the yeah. kind of things that are going to get covered by these mandates are the kind of outputs that, you know, realistically wouldn't have earned anyone very much money no. anyway. And when you think about it, when, you know, you and I responded to the UKRI consultation, um, well, it was a document, wasn't it, to the consultation mm -hmm. on their policy and having a revised policy for open access, one of the big questions was, well, what is a book? You know, mm. what actually what will this policy apply to? Will it apply to textbooks? Will it apply to monographs? Will it apply to like long form publications? You know, mm. um, so I think there's still quite a lot of kind of nuance around what actually they mean by a book. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think you're right. There probably will be a bit of kind of loopholes, shall we say, or um, there's going to have to be a real... Um, a definition of what that actually means. Yeah, definitely, because, uh, you know, a monograph is a book, uh, a textbook is a book, uh, yeah. a book of poetry is a book, um, you know, a, a short introduction to neuropsychology is a book. Um, Absolutely. You know, but not all of these are research, and 
not all of these are the kind of materials that are going to be covered by these mandates and these kind of requirements. And, and I think the problem is, is the word book covers all kinds of things. Um, and, I, and I do think that there's going to have to be clearer definitions, or, or I think you will get that kind of knee-jerk reaction from yeah. a lot of authors and a lot of academics of, you know, well, well why should I make something available for free um, that previously, you know, I would have been paid by a publisher for, and I would have got royalties, and I would have got sales, and I would have got public spending right payments yeah. and things like that. So I think there definitely needs to be that, that clear definition of what is going to be covered and what isn't. Um, Absolutely. Otherwise, I think it, it will get met with a bit of resistance. And, you know, I mean, just thinking about, like we've already kind of mentioned, you know, journals, it's taken us a hell of a long time to get to where we are now, and we've still got mm. quite a long way to go. You know, there's still a yeah. lot of resistance there from researchers, authors, academics. Um, so I think 2024, like you say, it might be a little bit optimistic, um, but we'll see. Think- We'll see. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges, and and this is definitely something where I think universities can support staff, is that, you know, the the concept of prestige is still hugely important in in academia. The idea of not just what you're publishing, but where are you publishing it? Who are you publishing it with? um, You know, is, is, is really, really still a big thing. You know, the idea that you publish in this journal versus this journal, because this one, you know, is much, much more reputable. It's got this reputation, you know, versus this open access one, maybe, which, you know, isn't as well known or doesn't have, you know, as big an impact factor. You know, the, the idea of, oh, I'm, I'm publishing a book with Oxford University Press versus yeah. I'm, I'm publishing it with this small open access publisher. You know, that idea of prestige um, and the kind of metrics that go along with it is hugely important in higher education. Now, whether it should be or not, is another matter entirely um, and I think that is, has always been one of the biggest challenges to open access is that you know academics totally understandably want to publish with the big names they want to be seen to be publishing you know in the really high-ranking reputable journals or with the you know the really big brand name recognition publishers um, and you know you can't blame anyone for that. Who, we all want, would want to be. Oh, I'm a I'm an OUP publisher. You know, I'm I'm published in Nature. It's totally understandable. Um, but I think that that kind of attitude and that kind of approach and that kind of instinctive equating high ranking or reputable with quality, um, I, I think, can act as a real barrier to a lot of this because it. It kind of shapes where people want to publish and, and makes them think about reputation rather than getting the research out there to a, to the widest possible audience. And I think, you know, the way universities approach these things doesn't help in, in some respects. I think the way REF approaches these things doesn't help. But I think particularly when, you know, there's this publish or perish culture in, in higher education and where you see, you know, universities moving to, to using things like publishing metrics um, or, you know, the amount of funding money that they're bringing in to, to base employment decisions on, um, I think is, is a real challenge to the open access movement because, you know, open access publishers and, and open access journals are never going to be able to compete on those kind of terms with your Nature and your Oxford University Press and your, you know, your Cambridge University Press in, in terms of that reputation. They're, they're never going to be able to compete. But if that's what people are valuing over getting the research out there in the widest possible mechanism, um, then you're always going to have that kind of clash. And and so I think that is definitely something that universities can help with, Um, you know, and, and, you know, one way is to to stop using things like publishing metrics for for basing employment decisions on, because quite apart from anything else, you know, there's a gender equality issue there. You know, it's it's endless studies have shown that, that men publish more than women, you know, it was really noticeable during the pandemic last year that submissions from women went down and submissions from men went up because of all the kind of societal issues that go along, you know, being a woman in academia, you know, childcare, parenting, you know, all of these kind of gender issues come into play as well. Um, you know, men don't have to take maternity leave. Um, you know, so all of these kind of things that, that can interrupt the kind of life cycle of academia can have a, a gender issue in terms of impacting, you know, women potentially more than men. Um, 
And so universities basing so much weight on metrics and, and where you publish and impact factors, um, you know, I think is a barrier to open access, but it's also a barrier to a lot of the quality and, and, and diversity issues as well um, that really need to be addressed. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that all this kind of open access stuff is, is tangled up in a, a really complicated web of quite a lot of other things as well. And, and it's a challenge to tease all those bits out, I think. Absolutely. I mean, it's really interesting what you say about universities, you know, playing um, a role really to help the sector um, mm. to move away from, like you say, you know, prestige, um, thinking about how um, how it looks where you publish fundamentally. Mm. Um, yeah. Do you think there are other kind of, could there be other kind of positive disruptions that um, universities could could um, do or help achieve? Um, I think more universities publishing their own is a good start. You know, there are universities out there with their own open access presses, um, and I think that can be a really positive way um, of doing it. Um, you know, I think giving staff time <laughs> to research and write, I think, is a definite, definite thing, because again, you know, I think you have traditional research universities and you have traditional teaching universities. You know, you have staff in, in some institutions where they maybe only teach a couple of hours a week and the rest is research. Um, and then you will have staff at other institutions where their primary job is teaching and, and research is fitted in somewhere. So I think, you know, recognising that those two different kinds of institutions are not going to be competing on the same level, um, you know, giving staff time to do the research if research is expected of them, um, I think is important. I, I think, you know, having in-house options I think is always beneficial um, you know like open access presses in-house and some universities are starting to, to do that now um, you know can there be incentives in-house for publishing open access I, I don't know it's, it's a possibility I think awareness raising is, is hugely important because you know just speaking from from my own experience and you know you will probably agree with me on this a lot of staff are not necessarily fully up to speed on all the complexities of funder mandates and open access and, you know, publishing and gold and green and diamonds and, and all of these various things. It's, it's getting increasingly complicated and there's a lot to, to know, there's a lot to understand, there's a lot to tease out. And I think a lot of staff are quite confused in some respects about what it all means. You know, they you know, there's predatory publishers that come into the mix as well. And, and I think with some stuff, they just want to get published. You know, they, they just need to get published. And, you know, they aren't always taking the time to think about all these different options and weigh up all of the different options and, and what does green mean and what does gold mean and what does diamond mean. And, you know, what this, this journal, if I publish here, what does it mean versus this journal? And, and I think there's a lot of confusion out there. That, that needs clearing up and I think universities can help with that absolutely I think it's it's a, it's a challenging one um I mean I would love to see some kind of uh I'm not sure how to describe this really like for example in football terms there's a certain amount of money that the Premier League um, and the Premier League clubs provide that go to like grassroots football and lower level football to kind of support the, the clubs that are not your Manchester United and your Liverpools and your Chelsea's um, and, you know, and recognise that huge swathes of money goes into to those top clubs pockets, but it needs to filter down as well. It would be great to see something like that with, your, you know, your Russell Group universities that, that hoover up so much of all of this kind of research funding, you know, kind of kind of having a bit of trickle down economics going on there and, and a bit of support for the lower level universities. Um, you know, stuff like that, I think, would be immense. I don't see it happening, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, it works in football. Well, I'm not sure it does entirely work in football, but it's there in principle. Um, you know, something like that, because I think, you know, some universities where there are amazing staff and excellent researchers often miss out um, on a lot of research opportunities. Um, either because they just don't know about it or they don't have the, the infrastructure in their institutions to apply for some of these grants and bids, um, or they just don't have the clout. The risk of almost ending up with a kind of two-tier um, research hierarchy in some respects, in, in that we know how important metrics are. We know how important it is to be published in, in you know, particular journals, particular high-ranking journals. But, you know, increasingly, in order to meet the kind of funder mandates, 
um, you know, you've got to be paying those article processing charges. You've got to be paying those really quite hefty fees in order to get published in those journals and to meet the funder mandates. And, you know, increasingly, you know, there are a lot of universities that don't have the funds to do that. They don't have the money to be able to be paying these thousands of pounds in article processing charges. And so, you know, you, you could potentially end up with, you know, only the top universities can afford to publish in the top journals. And you just end up with this kind of self reinforcing hierarchy um, where, you know, other universities like the post 92 universities, um, you know, can't just can't catch up. They can't compete because they don't have the funds to do so. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that the overall kind of research sector, you know, and the higher education sector needs looking at in some respects because i think we are in danger of developing this kind of two-tier system where you've got your your premier league your russell group um you know and then you've got your 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 championship or your you know your division one um and you know there is no relegation and promotion system in place um you know and so I, i think that would be bad for education, I think it would be bad for research. I, I certainly think it would be bad for things like social mobility and equality and diversity. You know, and I, I think we're in danger of that with with so much about publishing and open access being contingent on having the money to do it now. Um, which is another reason why I'm not a huge fan of academic publishers. Going back to uh, ebook SOS, <laughs> not all just about ebooks. <laughs> no. I think there's just way too much money in uh, in academic publishing in general, quite frankly, and and I think it 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 has a damaging impact on the sector, on on education, on research. I, I I do think it is is damaging because it all becomes about money rather than access to information and access to research and and you know getting global knowledge out there to to improve everybody's lives. You know, it, it just becomes about money, um, and I think. That, that isn't something that should have a place in, in education and knowledge. Um, no. But increasingly it does. I agree with you. And, you know, I think the longer we continue to just kind of focus on this commodification of knowledge um, and give all the power and money to the um, publishers, we're going to be in this cycle for, you know, a long time to come. I think we are and I think you know that is is one of the primary reasons why you know personally I am involved in things like the ebook SOS campaign why I am involved in in Wikipedia um because it is all about you know widening people's access to knowledge it is all about removing those barriers to knowledge and and recognizing that um that there are barriers that there are lots of barriers you know you know across class across wealth across gender across race across you know, where you live and, and what you have access to and, and, you know, digital poverty and all of these kind of issues. But it is all about barriers being placed in the way of people getting access to the knowledge that we all need to better our lives. Um, you know, and that is, that's why I'm campaigning about ebooks. It's it's why I'm a trustee of, of Wikimedia UK, because I, I think knowledge should be available to everyone. You know, I don't think it should only be available to the people who've got the deepest pockets. Couldn't agree more. Um, well, that's really interesting. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Um, All right. It's really interesting to hear your views and good luck with ebooks SOS. Um, I thank hope you. it continues to make the impact that it's already had. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. You know, <laughs> if, if, if things develop further, we'll have to come back on a ne- another podcast and talk about it. That would be great. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Open Knowledge Podcast. And thanks to Caroline for a fascinating discussion. We'll be back soon for more episodes.